Hope you are do all doing well today. We'll be getting started shortly. All right, it's a few minutes after 12, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Well, thank you for joining our uh, webinar today. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Change Labs, Change Labs is located in Tuba City and we are here um, helping native entrepreneurs. Some of the things that we provide here at Change Labs is we provide uh, a workspace, creative workspace, uh, tools and resources and knowledge for native entrepreneurs. And we do that in a few different ways. Well, one of the things um, that we get asked quite a bit when we have people either visit one of our webinars, um, visit our co-working space or visit our website is um, they ask the question, how do I start a business? And so we uh, get asked that question quite frequently. So we have some tools and resources to help Native entrepreneurs um, start their business. We offer business coaching um, every Monday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we do have appointments set up for that. And all you have to do is go and visit nativestartup.org uh, backslash events to look and see which business coaches are available. Again, we're all, um, we rotate every Monday. So you can check that out and schedule an appointment. And we give you an hour and a half with each appointment. So it's great time to speak to one of our business coaches here at Change Labs. We also have a business incubator at Change Labs. And what we offer is we offer different services with our business incubator. And right now we do have a cohort of um, 10 members going through our business incubator program at Change Labs. And it's the year long program where we provide tools, resources. Uh, we connect you to some of the other native entrepreneurs in the area. Uh, we have guest speakers that come on and talk about their experience of starting a business on the Navajo Nation or Hopi Nation. So if you're interested in learning more about that, again, go to our, our website, um, nativestartup.org backslash incubator. Another question we get uh, is, how do I create a website? So we do have... Um, members who are able to help um, answer that question. We do provide uh, resources. And again, that is something that we do help you with um, at our, in our incubator program. So um, if you're interested in learning how to create a website, um, you can actually um, check that out on our website and meet with a coach on that. We do have a lot of, um, information at our YouTube channel. So if you check out nativestartup.org backslash resources, you can actually find out information on those two questions, how to start a business and also um, how to create a website. Uh, we have more than 35 videos. Um, we've done a lot of recording over the last 12 months, actually more like last um, nearly two years. Um, so check out the website and check out the videos that we have on our YouTube channel. Another question that we get is how do I get help running my business? And so that's something that we're able to um, help you with here at Change Labs. Um, we have a creative co-working space uh, that is located in Tuba City. And that space provides um, desk space, uh, Wi-Fi, color printing, button making, monthly training, and more for entrepreneurs in the community. And actually, the space is, is not open at this at this time, but we will have a space up and running in 2022. So just keep your eyes and ears out on updates on our co-working space. It's a great space to be with other entrepreneurs. And we also have our Res Rising app. So the Res Rising app um, 
gives you access to over, what is this number, I can't see, 630 native businesses across the Southwest in a single space. So download download the Res Rising app and you'll be able to see other native businesses in your area or able to search to see who um, it is that you're looking for um, specifically. So you can go and check out that app um, at resrising.org. And if you have any other questions, um, you can contact Marsha Gray Eyes. She's a director of the co working space um, at Marsha at nativestartup.org. And we, she'll be happy to answer any questions you have. So, some of the housekeeping rules for our webinar is stay on mute until the question and answer session. Um, Type your questions in the chat and we'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. Uh, this session is being recorded for our YouTube channel as well. We are hiring here at Change Lab, so we're looking for a community advocate for the uh, Chuba City co-working space. And also we're looking for a communications and brand manager. If you or anyone you know is interested in a position with Change Labs, which is absolutely a great organization to work for, uh, check uh, out those open positions at native startup um, backslash dot org. And join us in the new year as we bring Tracy Jackson to our next webinar, which will be on January 12th, 2022 at 11.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And she'll be uh, going over indigenous storytelling. So culture, sport and design. So check that out, put that on your calendar. And with further ado, I'd like to introduce Joe Elliott Nez. He is the founder of Nez Technologies. And today he's going to be presenting from Ethernet to the Internet, the hows and whys of cyberspace. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this over and let Joe start sharing his screen. So welcome, Joe. Thank you, Christine. Appreciate that. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. Hello. Um, my name is Joel, Joel Inez, and I'm from Galp, New Mexico. And um, I'm the proud owner of NAS Technologics, and then we're an IT-based company here in Gallup, New Mexico, that serves the area here, and um, as, as well as the Navajo Nation. And um, we, we collaborated, collaborated with Change Labs to do some webinars, and this is the last of this series. And we felt like we could, you know, inform uh, the community about broadband and, and internet and what it is. So, you know, from ethernet to the internet, the hows and whys of cyberspace. And what we wanna do is, you know, what is the internet? Uh, I kind of just wanna throw that out there and kind of ask the audience, you know, you either can put it in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself um, and just kind of, give us your interpretation of what is the internet. So I wanna go ahead and put that out there just for a moment and see what you all think. What is the internet? I'm gonna give you about a couple minutes. And don't be shy. You just put it in the chat or unmute yourself and uh, you know answer that question. What is the internet? And you know, if really you don't really understand what the internet is, then you know that's fine too. This is why we're we here. We're here to inform you of what the internet does. And Barbara had put in the chat a way to connect, and that's exactly one of the aspects of the internet is a way to connect people, devices, um, Internet of Things. They could, you could say, uh, and. You know, it's also a tool that we use heavily now, with especially with COVID, and so uh, internet is very important nowadays and very vital for our business and our education as well. 
All right, so the internet is a global network. It's a global network of billions of computers and other electronic devices. The internet makes it possible to access almost any information and allows you to communicate with anyone in the world. I could be in Japan doing this webinar and you, somebody's on the reservation, you know, uh, that's how far of a reach we could communicate using the internet. And you, you can do all this by connecting a computer or a smartphone to the internet, and which also is called going online. When they say going online, that's when someone says, all right, I'm gonna get on the internet, you know, and they're gonna use a computer to, to connect to the internet. Also, going online is accessing what's known as a world wide web. And nowadays it's kind of cut down to web for short. And it's World Wide Web is a collection of different websites that you can access through the internet. You know, website is made up of related text, images, and other resources like pictures, video. Websites can also resemble other forms of media, like it could, like newspaper articles, blogs, television programs, also known as streaming, or they could be an interactive way that's unique to computers. And they could be used for applications and almost anything can be accessed through a website. And nowadays, news platforms, advertisements, online libraries, forums for sharing images, or educational websites, they all can be found on the World Wide Web. Once you're connected to the internet, you can access and view websites using an application called a web browser. And just to keep in mind that a web browser itself is not the internet. It's just an application that allows you to display the websites that are stored on the inter internet. So you can think of web browsers like kind of vehicles that you would take to drive um, around town to get to different locations. So you can think of Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Microsoft Edge, and you can think those as vehicles, just like how you would drive a Chevrolet, a Dodge, a Ford, it's all about preference. You know, what browser fits you? What do you like? What are you more familiar with? Um, and some browsers actually work better um, with different applications just because of how that web application was developed. So some web applications will be, you know, better on a Chrome browser or an Edge browser, but wouldn't really work with Firefox. And so, you know, having those browsers on your, on your computer will help you you know, benefit. And so if Chrome's not working, you could try Firefox and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, understanding what a browser is and how to access websites is very important. And how does the internet work? You know, y'all be wondering how does the internet work? And the answer is pretty complicated. And it would take about a whole class just to explain the complexities of how it all works. You know, it takes a complex system, both hardware and software, for it to all work and for, a, for them to all integrate. And instead, instead of explaining the complexities of it, we're just going to go over some of the more important things that you should know about the Internet. And once you realize that the Internet is a global network of physical cables, which includes copper telephone wires, coax TV cables, and nowadays fiber optic cables. Right now, in the, in the photo that you see is from telegeography. And this is actually a network of submarine cables that connect the entire world. So they're basically fiber cables that are ran um, underneath the ocean and connects, you know, continents together so that way we can communicate in an in instantaneous fashion. So sorry, I'm back. So the the wireless connections nowadays are also known as Wi-Fi or 4G and 5G. And those wireless connections, they rely on these physical cables to access the internet wirelessly. So 
in order to connect to a wireless connection, you do have to have some type of physical cable connecting to either a tower that's feeding off the, the cellular connection, or if you have what's known as a Wi-Fi router, connect, it needs to be connected to an internet connection, which is most likely a physical cable of some sort. And when you visit a website, your computer sends a request over these wires to a server. And a server is basically a computer which is souped up to be able to handle the workload to store websites. And so once the requests arise from the server, it retrieves the website files and then sends that correct data back to your computer. And this all happens within just a few seconds, depending on your internet speed. So any website that you visit, say for instance, uh, Google or just a, a regular website that you're visiting um, from a, a local business, those websites are stored on a server somewhere, either in the cloud using services from hostings like GoDaddy or Wix or Squarespace. Um, those are the more cloud-based websites that um, nowadays a lot of businesses utilize uh, just because it's um, a lot more efficient for them to, to you know, give that workload to somebody who's just there just to, to host the websites. And, you know, before all of that, you would actually have an actual computer turned on in, in your household and it's actually online every 24 seven just to handle the websites. Um, but nowadays, you know, going with hosting web services, uh, that's the way to go just to be more efficient and, you know, cost, cost efficient as well. The next question is, what can you do online? With the expansion of the internet, there's almost no limit to what you can do online. And the internet makes it possible to communicate, communicate with people around the world. You could either use email, you know, which is using like right now, Google provides free email services and that's gmail.com. And also Microsoft provides free email. And I believe there's is outlook.com. And then there's some other ones that you can find online that are, are free. They all have the differences. Um, some prefer, you know, some like Google is pretty constant and actually it's a lot easier to have email with Google just for the case of, you know, your smart devices, they use that to, to use that for your account. And also, you know, video chat. A lot of people use video chat to communicate. Um, like for instance, uh, us right now, we're in a sort of video chat using Zoom. And also there's Google Meet uh, and Skype. So those are all kind of instances where you can use video chat to communicate. And another one is instant messaging. Uh, instant messaging is kind of a little bit more older in terms of how you would communicate. Like for instance, Yahoo Messenger used to be pretty um, useful back before you know videos um, and before social media. Um, so instant messaging is another way to communicate. And then now the new way a lot of people communicate is using social media. Social media includes Facebook. It also includes Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. And there's just another way people can communicate with each other um, online. Another thing that you can do online is find information. Um, the term Google it kind of nowadays is what people utilize. And Google is one of the biggest search engines um, in the world, and they, you know, pushed for using that services to provide people to search different things of websites. So Google allows people to search just about anything, you know, how to fix a flat or how to change your oil, you know, a lot of questions that you can ask and look for information. You can use search engines. And another search engine that is um, also out there is another one called DuckDuckGo. Um, you know, DuckDuckGo is a search engine that doesn't have a lot of ads like Google does. And so, you know, some people are kind of 
tired of the ads that pop up from Google. And so the search engines are out there, DuckDuckGo, you got Yahoo. Um, another one is Microsoft Bing. Um, and so those are the different search engines you could use to search for anything on the web. And another information that you could look for is forums. You know, forums are a great way to also communicate with other people and also talk about different things and ask, ask questions and people can then give their input and some of their answers that they think are the answer to your questions. So on um, the internet, on um, going online is a great way to find information, you know, you know, depending on what you're looking for. And what you also could do online, stream media. So nowadays streaming is the big thing. People love to go on the internet and go to YouTube to watch videos of how to's or nowadays vloggers, people who, you know, that do, they showcase their day-to-day -day activities and also, you know, YouTube live, you can actually live broadcast onto YouTube. So that's another way to, to stream media. And also now um, the new way is Netflix in terms of streaming videos, no more blockbusters or front row seats. Um, streaming has kind of took over that market. And now you'll see new up and coming like Hulu. Some other ones are also like Pluto TV. Um, you know, just these are just services that provide media to you for you to stream your favorite movies, your favorite shows, and also streaming music. Um, now, uh, Spotify has been, you know, allows you to find our particular artists that you're interested in or different genres of music that you're looking for. And also iHeartRadio is another way to, to connect to your, your favorite artists. Um, and iHeartRadio actually has purchased uh, broadcast air. So, you know, some of the local radio stations that you listen to, you can actually, instead of listening through your FM radio, you can listen to it online using their iHeartRadio app. And then also Pandora is another streaming media for music. So those are just some of the things that you could do in terms of streaming and accessing content from, on the, from the internet, from online. And then also you can do just about everyday tasks, you know, looking at, you know, maybe checking your bank account, seeing how much you have in your bank. And also you can do online purchases. Um, right now, Amazon's one of the biggest online retailers where you can just find about anything to purchase and they can get it to you within two days, three days, depending on uh, if you have the Amazon Prime. And also, you know, eBay is an auction that you can utilize to purchase things. So, you know, just, we could just about do anything online nowadays. And, and, and that's just due to the fact that the internet has been growing and growing and, you know, the connection to it has been, has been getting faster. And so th those allow for us to, to utilize the content that we need to access online. Now, next question is, how do you connect to the internet? You know, people wonder, how do we get online? And first, what you need to do is purchase uh, home internet access or a wireless internet carrier from a, from a carrier. So you can send and receive email, you can browse the web and stream videos. They are known as internet service providers. Also, acronym they use is ISP. And you know, they offer different types of services. And the, their, their services are based on speed, also known as download and upload speeds. So if you're looking at different service providers, some, some of them provide lower download and upload speeds, some provide higher download and upload speeds. And depending on what you're trying to do and how you're trying to connect it in, in terms of, you know, do you, you want to stream video? Do you want to do video live chat? You know, speed is an important factor for you to um, access the internet and be efficient. So, you know, there's a thing called buffer. And, you know, if you have low speeds and you're trying to video chat with somebody, you'll have buffer. Or if you're trying to stream a video and 
um, maybe you don't want the the standard definition but you want the high definition video you know your speed can affect that and you'll get that buffer where it's a little um, bar that's just spinning and spinning and spinning and you just you know have to wait until it buffers again and you can access the video another type of different services they offer is based on data size and as you can see the acronyms for data for speeds right now the standard is it's called megabits per second and that's m capital m lowercase b p s and for the data size it's known as megabytes capital m capital b and these service providers use different forms of connection and the first one the oldest one and also the slowest one is the the cringing dial up you know you want to avoid this type of connection you know you don't want to get dial up dial up is you know going to be waiting for years just to watch that one video uh, and you know nowadays dial up is phasing out um, but you know there are still some areas that do still use dial up because just you know the region that the technology that's there um, and so uh, dial up uses internet using your phone line so you have to actually have multiple phone lines if you want to use your internet and your phone line at the same time uh, like i guess some of the older folks like myself i remember dial up being you know you couldn't get on the phone because you're on the internet so you would have to disconnect from the internet to to make the calls or you'd get a busy signal when you're trying to call somebody but they're on the internet and i, I just remember those times when those would occur and i'd get told to to get offline <laughs> but you know dial up is you know the older older technology and the newer one that's now that's utilized most frequently is dsl which stands for digital subscriber line and dsl services they use an ethernet broadband connection and which makes it much faster than dial up and dsl connects to the internet via same thing a phone line but it does not require you to have a landline at home so you can actually use your dsl and your phone line at the same time without having any interruption and the third one the third form of connection is cables so cable services connects you to the internet via a cable tv connection also known as coax cable Although you don't need to necessarily have cable TV in order to get it, it does uses a broadband connection and it's a lot faster than both dial up and DSL service. However, it is only available where cable TV is available. So for instance, Xfinity, you know, they use Comcast, no, Xfinity Comcast now they're known as, they use coax cable that, you know, if, um, you can just have internet by itself without actually getting the Comcast TV service. So um, that's actually what I use for my ISP is Xfinity. And they use that coax cable to run into my house and then um, it's connected to to modem here. And the next one, next form of connection, which is, um, you know, especially in a rural area, you can actually um, get some good connections depending on where you're located and if the satellite connection is a lot closer. So satellite connections, it uses broadband, but it does not require cable or phone line. And it connects the internet through satellites orbiting the earth. And I was, as a result, it can be used almost anywhere in the world. But the connection may be affected by weather patterns just because, you know, there's that layer of clouds and um, storms and so that can hinder some of your connections to the satellites and um, satellite connections are a little usually a little bit slower than DSL or cable um, like one for instance Usenet is one satellite provider um, ISP provider um, 
you know, their speeds aren't, you know, that great. Uh, but now, you know, there's a new one, Starlink, that's been coming on board. And they actually have a lot higher speeds than uh, what HughesNet provides because they use a different side, a different type of technology to connect their satellite systems to to their their satellite connections here um, at, at your at your house. And the last one, another form of, connect, of, of connection to the internet is the 4G and 5G cellular connection. And you know these now are most commonly used with mobile phones. Um, it connects wirelessly through your, your ISP network, which is also known as your carrier. And um, however, you know, these connections aren't always as fast as a DSL or, or, or cable connection, just due to the fact that, um, you know, wherever you're lo located, how close you are to the tower, you know, are there any obstructions between you and the tower? So for instance, you're in the building that has concrete, and you know you can lose cellular connection, and your your data speeds won't be as as fast. And also, you know, nowadays um, cellular carriers they can limit the amount of data you can use each month, and, and that's what it's called throttling. They can, you know, so they they say you can use um, thirty gigabytes of data of high speed data, but after that, then they throttle you, and so you won't get the high speeds, and so. Um, you know that's the case with one of the, most of these um, cellular 4G, 5G broadband plans. And also, you know, you need uh, some devices to actually access the internet. And the primary piece of hardware that you need to connect to the internet is a modem. And you know, you also need a router to connect if you want to connect multiple devices. And another type of access is using wireless tethering, also known as a hotspot. Uh, that's where you can use your, your cell phone, smartphone, and it has the ability to utilize your data from your carrier and access internet, like in terms of a hotspot. So you turn it on and you know up to, I think 15 devices can connect to that device depending on the hardware that you have and you just with the click of a button you can turn on your hotspot and people around you can connect to your wireless device and use your data to go online and connect to the internet and you also need a computer or smart device to connect to the internet and next i want to kind of go over what are data speeds and size so first thing we're going to look at is what is download and upload? So download is actually what you pull from the internet. So if you want to download a file like a document, a music file or a video file, you actually go to wherever that file is hosted and you know, you'd say download here or click here to download. And what that does is it pulls that data from that server and it copies itself in, onto your computer and you're actually pulling that data from the internet. And upload is what you push to the internet. So uploading in file like a document, music file, or video, you know, you would upload these files to let's say Google Drive, Dropbox, um, also, you know, OneDrive for, for Microsoft. And those are all known as cloud storage. And, you know, so, or for instance, say you're posting a picture or video to social media, what you're doing is actually uploading that file to that social media platform. And, you know, when, when you either download or upload those files, you know, you're looking at how fast can it go, how fast can you download it and how fast can you upload it? And when we look at the speeds, Right, right now, you know, the there's a kilobit per second, a megabit per second, and a gigabit per second. And you know, we're, first thing we're going to look at is what is bits. So bits are, are the basic unit of information in computing. So 
you can also they're also known as zeros and ones or maybe a yes or no positive or negative on or off and they're basically binary units in terms of you know there's only two options and in the, our case data is known as data packets they send zeros and ones across you know the cables that we use and so for instance um if you're using an ethan or i'm sorry a, a electronic or like a electric current that's where copper comes from and that would it would be an on or off situation that either says yes or no and for the new way is fiber the the zeros and ones compute as on or off you know there's a light on there's a light off and so that is what allows you to interpret it, interpret those data and look at the bits of information that you're sending so in our case so if you look at the presentation you'll see that 1000 bits per second equals 1 kilobit per second and also 1000 kilobits per second equals 1 megabit per second and then 1000 megabits per second equals 1 gigabit per second and if you look at your data speed coming from your your internet provider most likely they fall into different categories and so if you want when we look at data speeds, it's either kilobits per second, megabits per second, and or gigabits per second. There's also one called terabits, but you know we still that still maybe about twenty years from now we'll probably be looking at the, the terabits. And now we're going to look at what the data sizes are. So now we're going to look at kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte and terabyte, also known as capital KB, capital MB, capital GB, and capital TB. And a byte actually equals eight bits. So there's eight bits of data, which equals one byte. And one byte, or so one, one kilobyte equals 1,024 bytes. And one megabyte equals 1,024 kilobytes. And one gigabyte equals 1,024 megabytes. And then one terabyte equals 1,024 gigabytes. So as you can see, it increments and from the kilo to mega to giga to tera. And each now we're in the, the ter terabyte phase where you can actually upload, you know, up into the terabytes of data um, to you know either a cloud account like Google Drive or OneDrive, Dropbox. Um, and so when you look at the data speeds and data sizes, that's where you can start to make the connections to how you actually connect to the internet. So for instance, the speeds for the different connections. So for dial-up, you're looking at anywhere from one to 54 kilobits per second on download and one to 28 kilobits per second on upload. And for DSL, we're looking at five to 35 megabits per second of download and one to 10 megabits per second of upload. And for cable, you're looking at 10 to 500 megabits per second of download and five to 50 megabits per second of upload. And then for satellite, now, you know, with the technology that's coming out, you can go anywhere from five to 150 megabits per second for download and one to 25 megabits per second of upload. And for cellular 4G, 5G, um, you can go anywhere from one megabit per second to 1000 megabits per second of download. And also the same for upload from one to 1000 megabits per second. And 1000 megabits per second, if you look at the conversion, that's actually one gigabit per second. And, um, you know, depending on where you're at in terms of your range from the cellular towers, it can vary, um, you know, 
the the 1000 megabits per second that's on the true 5g and so the only way you can get to that speed is if you they, they call it the millimeter wave and so that technology is it exists but right now it's not going it's not fully deployed to to um united states um they, they do have some testing facilities that can reach those but you know those are just under certain conditions but you know it's just promising of what they can actually get to if they actually you know start to implement that technology and then also the newest way is fiber you know fiber can run from 250 to 1000 megabits per second and for download and the same 250 to 1000 megabits per second of upload so those different types of speeds, you know, depending on what connection you have from your, your internet service provider can also, you know, determine how fast you want your internet. And also depending on their plans, a lot of these internet service providers, you know, they offer you certain tiers of services. Like for instance, um, like for CenturyLink, they'll do a 25, me, um, megabits per second download and 12 megabits per second upload and that's just more for like a residential but you can actually get the business plan if you're um, really needing the, the high speeds where you can double it and you can look at 50 megabits per second of download and then 25 megabits per second of upload and it all depends on what you're trying to how you what you want to do and access on the internet and and also how many people are on your network and that can bog down what's known as the bandwidth and your bandwidth is what you're allowed to utilize within your network and your connections and so the more people that are on your network and they're all streaming or maybe gaming you know using high data usage that can start to bog down your data speeds and you know limit what you can do and so, you know, a lot, that's why they have the higher speeds for business because they have, you know, they could assume that maybe there's going to be 30 people accessing that network and they're all going to be doing the high, high data speeds. And so they want an internet connection that can handle that. So now we want to look at what is a modem and a router. So, you know, primary piece of hardware that you need to connect to the internet is a modem. And a modem is a device that enables a computer to send or receive data over telephone or cable lines. You know, the data stored on the computer is digital, whereas a telephone line or cable wire can transmit only analog data. And so a modem basically converts an analog signal to digital signal and vice versa. And that's known as modulator and demodulator. And so the modem is a combination of those two devices of the modulator and demodulator. So the modulator converts the digital data into analog data when the data is being sent by the computer. And the demodulator converts analog signal into digital signal when it's being received by the computer. So the modem is basically a device that allows you to convert from analog to digital and vice versa. And modems are usually provided by the, the ISP that allows you to connect to their network. And the type of internet access you choose will determine the type of modem that you need. So for instance, dial-up access uses a telephone modem, DSL services uses a DSL modem, and cable, the coax cable access uses a cable modem. And for satellite services, it's usually just a satellite adapter that converts it. Next, and then what is a router? A router is a hardware device that allows you to connect several computers and other devices to a single internet connection, uh, which is also known as a home or business network. So the router is a, basically a network layer device allows you to connect two or more devices to the internet and also can be wireless, which is also known as Wi-Fi network. You want to think of a router. 
excuse me, you want to think of a router as an air traffic controller. And data packets are the aircrafts. You know, they're all headed to different airports. So you can think of the airports as the networks. So just as each plane has a unique destination and it follows a unique route, each packet needs to be guided in its destination as efficiently as possible. So each packet has a unique destination and it has its own route. So the router is basically acts as an air traffic controller that ensures you know, each packet is being reached to the destination without getting lost or there's no major disruption along the way. So a router helps direct data packets to the destination IP. And the destination IP basically is your address that you utilize from your network. So each network that you connect to has a specific IP for each. Uh, it's also known as your external network or your external IP address. And so each um, internet service provider gives you an IP address that allows you to connect to the internet. And so, you know, you can connect to the internet using a computer, smartphone, tablet, or smart device using modem with a router. But now with new technology, we're looking at what's known as the modem router. And a modem router uses both technologies in one device. So it, it, it's both a modem and a router. And it also can be wireless. And now a lot of ISPs have been, you know, given out a modem router because they found it more suiting to just have one device instead of giving somebody maybe two devices. And so, you know, some people do still use modems and it's just one single internet connection to that modem. Or some of them say you want to connect multiple devices and the modem router that was given to you by your ISP can't handle the workload that you need. So you can actually buy a router separately. And um, actually, you know, you can even say your, your modem router is um, not efficient enough to transmit signal for you to connect wirelessly, maybe 50 feet, and you want to extend it to 250 feet, you could buy a separate router, which allows you to connect, you know, from a further distance, or you can actually have more people connect to your network with that router. And, um, you know, most businesses will have their own router. They'll connect it to the, the modem and just just to serve a purpose of having more connectivity with multiple devices. And um, and actually you can get a lot more bandwidth from us separating your modem and router. But for most cases, in a personal usage, you know, the modem router that's provided by your ISP, um, that's sufficient enough because, you know, most people just connect wirelessly and that modem router has that capability. All right, I want to do a little activity, and so let's do some math. I hope there's some math majors out there or people that love to play with numbers, and I just kind of want to test your skills to kind of go over what we learned in terms of data speed. So say if we want to download a photo, that's, that is about 24 megabytes in size. And our download speed is about eight megabits per second. How long will it take to download the photo? And I'm going to give you guys a hint. So one byte equals eight bits. And then the formula, the download time equals file size divided by the internet download speed. And once you divide that, then you multiply it by eight. So I'll give you guys some time, give you about five minutes. So see if you guys can, can figure it out. I uh, kind of want to test your skills and this will kind of give you an idea of really how long it could take to download that 24 megabyte photo. So, you know, say that's, you know, like with the digital camera, uh, they could reach about that size for each photo just because 
the quality that you're taking. And so, you know, you want to download that photo from, from the internet that somebody had sent you. So how long will it take to download that photo if your data speed was eight megabits per second? And AC Max said three seconds. It's a good guess. Um, anybody else want to chime in and either through the chat or, okay, we got five seconds. In close, getting a little warmer. I'll let you guys kind of figure that out. I'm going to take a little drink here. All right, Cindy, the download internet speed is eight megabits per second. And that's typical for maybe DSL or coax. Right, I'd say more, more on the DSL side, uh, that would that'd be the case. Give you a couple more minutes. And, you know, don't be hesitant to answer, you know, uh, even if you're wrong, that's fine. You know, we, we're all learning. This is a good way to kind of understand uh, data speeds and data sizes and how we can combine both and to, to find out, you know, how long would it take. I know most of us just look at the, the progress bar and like, all right, cool. Another two seconds, another five seconds. Oh, wait, 10 seconds. I thought it was just two seconds ago. <laughs> and a lot of the computers, they all do the math for you. So when you do download, it gives you kind of estimated time of how long it'll take to download. So, you know, we can kind of cheat and just look at the estimated time that the browser usually gives and says, all right, you got, it's going to be two minutes for it to download. Okay. Cindy's still, she came up with three, but she's still not sure. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of break it down for you. So if you look at the, the formula, the download time equals file size divided by the internet speed, and then you multiply that by eight. So the file size is 24 megabytes and the download speed is eight megabits per second. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna say, all right, 24 divided by eight. And then what, what that gives you is three. So 24 divided by eight is three. Then you multiply eight. So three times eight is 24 seconds. So it'll take 24 seconds for you to download a 24 megabyte photo if you have a speed of eight megabits per second. And the tip for this is we want to look at the file size and the speed, but they must match. So for instance, if you're trying to say, we're looking at a one gigabyte file that you're trying to download, you know, huge file, um, we, we're not going to do one divided by eight because they're different in terms of, you know, gigabyte and a megabit. So we want to keep it kilobyte with a kilobit, or you want to do a megabyte with a megabit, or a gigabyte with a gigabit. So you want to keep them the same in terms of the, the kilo, the mega, and the giga. So for instance, in, in our answer here, 24 divided by eight. So they're both a megabyte and megabit. So we can keep that same. And you know, the eight is actually the bits. So uh, that's where we're able to get that, that answer. All right, one more, let's do some more math. Since we're kind of getting our brain excited and looking at another question. So this one, if we have only 50 gigabytes of data to use, how many hours of high definition streaming can we use before using all of our data? So this is a kind of a typical scenario. Say for instance, um, you have a plan that's only allowing you 50 gigabytes of data. And you know, how many hours of high definition streaming can we use before using all of our data? So you want to know, all right, how many hours of high definition streaming can I do maybe in a month? 
So what you're going to look at, and here's the hint. So one minute of high stream, high date or high definition streaming is approximately 41.7 megabytes. So for one minute of high definition streaming, you're going to use about 41.7 megabytes of data for one minute. And when you look at um, data sizes, if, if you go back to the previous slides or you know, looking at the conversion here, 1,024 megabytes equals one gigabyte. So I'm going to give you another five minutes to answer this question and let's see if we can come up with the right answer. Yeah, sure, I can put that in the chat. So I put it in the chat. The hint is one minute of high definition streaming equals approximately 41.7 megabytes. And if you look at how many megabytes equal one gigabyte, that's 1,024. And so if you kind of remember back on the last math that we did, we want to keep the conversion rate the same. All right. AC Mac here, right on the dot. That's exactly the answer. Twenty, approximately twenty point four six hours. So what that means is, if you want to watch high definition streaming, say a movie, typically a movie is about two hours. So we can watch about maybe ten movies in one month of high, like high definition movie. And so, you know, if you're trying to budget your data, you know, so you got 10 movies and within one month, you can only basically do about maybe two movies per week. So that's just one way to start thinking about data in terms of you can either look like the speeds that you're going to use and also the data usage that you're going to use. And since we got the right answer, Here's how AC Matt came up with it. <laughs> Let's kick off the desk, the old Mark skills, exactly. Oh, you're welcome. This is kind of keeping that that mind going and in, in terms of you know what data is, how we use it. And, and so the answer basically is 1024, which is we're converting a gigabyte into a megabyte. So there's 1,024 times 50. So we're converting that. And then from there, so we're going to do 1,000 times 24, 1,024 times 50. And then we're going to divide now the 41.7 megabytes times 60. And from there, that conversion rate will give you about 20 and a half hours. And the tip is all data sizes must be the same. So, if, you know, we're, we're converting um, megabytes into gigabytes and then um, megabytes into seconds. And, and so, and, or actually into to hours, to minutes. So that's the answers. All righty, we're gonna do one more math. I'm just kidding. All right, I kind of want to move on. Uh, now I want to talk about broadband on Navajo Nation. So currently there are several ISPs on the Navajo Nation. Um, one of the most prominent ones that is being utilized right now is NTUA Choice Wireless. And they utilize the 4G transmission in terms of wireless. So what they would do is um, they would provide you with a modem router that's connected, that has a built-in SIM card, almost like your smartphone that allows you to connect to any wireless carrier, um, but they have their own SIM card that connects to their own network, which is choice and two-way choice wireless. And they install that within your home and they actually have an external antenna that's pointing towards the tower that allows you to access their infrastructure or access their network. And, you know, they, a lot nowadays, you know, that's kind of 
um, especially with how the Navajo Nation, the regions are, you know, checkerboards, and it's just a lot harder to actually run cable. Like for instance, for the coax cable or for fiber or for excuse me, um, DSL, you know, those types of connections is really hard to, to provide on the Navajo Nation. And so um, we're using wireless transmission. Um, you know, it's one of the more easier ways to connect to the internet. And then, um, uh, especially with the emergency broadband that they have for um, rural areas, you know, they're actually providing internet at a low cost for, for everybody on the Navajo Nation. Uh, and also another ISP on the Navajo Nation is Sacred Winds Communication. Um, they do provide DSL, and in some cases, depending on where you're located, they can provide fiber. And just like NCOH with wireless, they provide fixed wireless. Um, so those are the several ways that you can connect to their network uh, on the Navajo Nation. Um, and uh, I think they're based out of around the Yatehe area. And um, so they, they, their reach um, cannot cover all of the Navajo Nation. It can just provide some um, internet for the local areas. Uh, and another uh, ISP on the Navajo Nation is Frontier. And they provide uh, DSL and, and some areas fiber, but from what I've um, known, Frontier just runs DSL around the local area. And again, the, another um, ISP on the Navajo Nation is HughesNet. A lot of people do utilize HughesNet just because the ability to connect um, to the internet using a satellite. You know, you don't need cable running all the way to your house. You can just use that satellite to connect to the internet. And, you know, all of these ISPs, they're very, they're all limited in terms of, you know, how fast speeds we can get. Um, some of them, I think NTUH Horse Wireless has plans for, I think it's a nine download, nine megabit per second download. And I think about around two megabit per second download. And then Sacred Winds, uh, I believe they're like in a 12.6, um, but, but depending on again, where you're located, those speeds can change. And also the tier of services that you, you know, if you want to pay higher, you can get faster downloads. And same for um, Houston. I do know that they have different speeds in terms of data plans. Uh, so some of them, um, if you're going to pay a lot higher, you get a little bit higher, higher, faster speeds. Um, but, you know, I, I do hear different things about these ISPs and, you know, the pros and cons about them. And, um, you know, if, wherever you want to use, you, it's best just to ask questions, you know, especially what we came with with today, which is, um, you know, the data speeds, data sizes, and then also, you know, what type of connections are they bringing to your house to connect to the internet? Next, I want to talk about fiber on the Navajo Nation. So, there's a, a company called Arcadian Infracom, and um, they're teaming with uh, an investment company, TIAA, to build a backbone route of fiber. And they're going to run, run fiber from, the, from Phoenix, Arizona to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then from Phoenix, Arizona to Denver, Colorado. And right now, this is in progress, and it's tentatively scheduled to be completed by mid-2023, uh, but it all depends on COVID and, you know, how that plays out. Um, they, they could have been completed uh, in 2022, but things, you know, were at a standstill, and so right now, you know, if this, once this installs, once this is installed on in the area, you know, it'll bring a lot of connectivity to the Navajo Nation in terms of, uh, you know, the ISPs that I did mention with into h Trust Wireless, Frontiers, Sacred Wind, they all can tap into this connection and provide actual 
higher bandwidth in terms of speed and you know they can serve the community um, with higher speeds of internet and also um, you know different data rates and according to the press release the fiber routes are enabled by the 2018 first of its kind of value sharing partnership between Arcadian and the Navajo Nation for the construction of this long haul fiber route through the Navajo Reservation. You know, this diverse fiber routing provides such needed network diversity and resiliency, security, and improved latency for Arcadian's global cloud that they've built. And also the content carrier cable and ISP customers that they provide this route for. And this routing strategy also synergistically enables high-speed broadband access and it creates economic opportunities in rural and tribal communities along their Arcadian route. And so this is the map of whether we're going to be running the fiber. So as you can see from Phoenix, they're running a fiber all the way to Flagstaff. And then from Flagstaff, there's going to, it's going to come up um, and break it up into a Y. And one is going to go towards Salt Lake City and the other is going to go to Denver. And what this provides is redundancy. So um, I do know, um, especially in my area, um, we did have internet outage. Uh, I think it was about a couple, six months back. I know sometime this past year, but the internet and Gallup completely went out. We had no ability to do banking. The banks were closed. Um, all our credit card machines were down. Our, even our internet service for wireless carriers like Verizon, um, T-Mobile, AT&T, they all were down. And that was all due to one fiber cut from Gallup to Albuquerque. And um, since there's no redundancy. Once we're cut, we're basically cut from the world because um, there's no uh, there's no other connection to connect to the network to the internet. And so this will provide you know a lot of redundancy and um, you know higher speeds within the area. And Arcadian mentioned on their website that they are honored to partner with the Navajo Nation in the, the development of routes throughout Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. And this special collaboration result in a very unique long haul network solution for the North America fiber infrastructure market. And Arcadian has replicated this direct value sharing partnership approach with other several Native American tribes, rural communities and states along their fiber routes. And as you can see, this route can be used to increase the bandwidth on the Navajo Nation and it allows internet service providers to give out higher speeds and better data rates. And because um, right now, how much they're charging to the customers is pretty steep compared to what you would pay in a metro area like in Albuquerque or Phoenix. Um, and so this will actually you know, benefit the community in so many ways. And if you can see the why that connects from Salt Lake to Denver, and it goes to Flagstaff. There's a little Y right there um, up in the Northern Arizona region. And that actually comes through Cameron, Arizona. And what this could actually provide is a potential to place uh, a data warehouse in that area, uh, just because of the redundancy. The, so you have three fiber lines coming in um, from different areas. So if one gets cut, they still have an ability to still connect to the world. So, you know, this provides some potential opportunity for data warehouses to come into the area and um, provide high paying jobs to the locals within that region. So that's one great, you know, thing about this whole project and also just the, the ability to connect to this whole backbone, you know, other ISPs or the, even the Navajo Nation could use some of their ARPA funding to create little rings around this fiber network to allow, you know, other areas to get on that fiber line. So there's potentials to, you know, provide internet to 
our nation. And, you know, this is I'm really looking forward to this, this project to be completed and see how we can, you know, utilize our access to the internet, which is duly needed. And Cindy had asked, is there any info out there you can provide related to Arcadian? Yes, um, so they do have a website and I provided it here on the slide and um, it's um, HTTPS colon backslash backslash forward slash forward slash arcadianinfra.com. Or you can just go in the browser and just type in arcadianinfra.com. And you know, on their website, they do have a lot of information about this project and other projects that they have done within other Native American communities. And so I just wanted to kind of point out that this is a project that's up and coming and it's um, it can affect Navajo Nation in a positive way. All right, um, I'd like to kind of open up for questions. Um, anybody have any questions about the webinar or, you know, internet or anything in general? <coughs> You can either unmute yourself if you have a question or um, type, type it in chat and then I'd be gladly able to answer. No other questions or? And Cindy had asked, uh, which um, ISP on nomination do you believe provides great service for remote areas? Um, honestly, um, Right now, um, NCUA Choice Wireless has, you know, expanded their reach and um, they've been able to access a lot more remote areas. Uh, and it's due to, um, it's called the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum for rural areas that the um, federal communication has put out for um, native communities and the Navajo Nation had applied and they were able to use some of that spectrum to allow people with the community to access the internet using uh, that spectrum. And so N2A uh, was, was able to get that. And, and so now N2A has been able to reach more areas, but just due to the fact that their bandwidth alone, the, the, you know, they don't really have a, a backbone, like a fiber backbone that you would need to actually increase the data speeds. Um, so, um, you know, nine megabits per second of download and two upload, um, it's, that's kind of the minimal. Um, and, you know, download, it, it, it'll be okay to download, you know, if you're just by yourself and, and not very many people in your network and you can download pretty quickly, but where it would affect it is upload. So say for instance, you're doing a Zoom call, your you know, a video chat, that can kind of limit you from participating in an efficient matter because you can have some buffering or some, some glitching within your video feed. So, um, but in terms of um, like with Sacred Win or Frontier, or um, HughesNet, uh, you know, satellite internet is actually as like with Starlink, uh, I was able to get get the beta version of it. And there were some remote areas that I wasn't able to get really good cellular connection, but with, with the satellite um, that they just launched well, a couple of weeks ago and then, the, you know, a month ago, uh, those have been actually increasing uh, the speeds and the connectivity with, with Starlink. So actually I'm looking forward to, you know, the Starlink going out of beta into actually retail. And uh, within uh, next year, it looks like they're gonna be, start kind of push that out to the more general population. And that, that I would recommend Starlink to anybody that's in a remote area, uh, just for the fact that I've, test that and um, know that it works um, in those remote areas where there's not very many cellular connections or even, you know, cable connections from using DSL or, or coax. That's a great question, Cindy, though. Um, anybody else? Any other questions? Comments? Okay. 
Oh, and uh, just a quick marker too on the, the last question. But for Starlink, when I tested it, it actually got up to 100 megabits per second in that remote area. And it, it did lose connectivity for about five minutes, but they reconnected again. But that was before they actually released more satellites into orbit. So now it actually the connectivity has been stable, pretty strong, and it, you know getting 50 megabits per second, which is you know terrific in in, in that remote area. And if you're interested in getting you know, Starlink, you can go to their website. You can sign up and you know get on their waiting list, and hopefully they can get back to you and um, you usually put down like a $99 deposit. And then from there, um, once you get selected, then you, you pay for your equipment, which is another like 500. And then from there, um, you pay about 99 bucks a month and they don't throw out you. There's no data cap for that. So it's kind of that. Let those out there interested in, you know, Starlink that, uh, but I believe this can be really good internet provider. Yeah, I can put that in the chat. The, let me just double check. Okay, I put the link to Starlink on the chat. So if anybody interested in you know that internet service provider, uh, you can start looking at that and see if you're, it's available within your area. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, Joe. Definitely a lot of good information for folks out there. Great. Thank you, Christine. All right. And just a reminder that we are hiring. If you're interested in learning more about the available or open positions at Change Labs, go to nativestartup.org backslash jobs. And again, on January 12th, 2022, at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time, we are, will be hosting Tracy Jackson, an ind indigenous storyteller who's going to be talking about culture, sport, and design. So join us on January 12th for our next webinar. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christine Laughter. I am the Director of Kinship Lending. If you do have any questions, you may contact Marsha Grayeyes at marsha at nativestartup.org. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. And thank you again, Joe, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Christine. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And appreciate all your participation. And a quick uh, question from Cindy. Uh, Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, will you provide more technology events? Um, as of now, this is our last webinar uh, for Change Labs, but um, maybe in the future, if there's other things that they um, feel like they want to provide to the community as well in terms of technology, we'll definitely um, let the public know and uh, it'll be on their website, um, nativestartup.org slash events, and you can see what upcoming webinars are, are available. And also you can go to our YouTube channel, Cindy. We do have um, the series of webinars that Joe has hosted over the last 12 months. So check that out also to get um, information on more of Joe's webinars. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks everybody, have a great day.